Hello everyone! In this video, I'm going to show you how you can make a 360 render of your Minecraft build in Blender. This is basically an updated version of my previous Blender tutorial, so if you're already familiar with that and how to do the basics, then you could skip ahead to wherever you need to. I'll put some timestamps in the description in case you're looking for a certain part of this video. Before we get started, all of the programs you will need are Mineways, Blender, and Photoshop. And of course, Photoshop is the only one of those that isn't free. If you wanted a free alternative, I would recommend looking into GIMP, but for this tutorial, I will be using Photoshop. The first thing I'm going to do is open Mineways, then navigate to wherever you saved your schematic or the world that has your build. It's usually easier to use a schematic because then you don't have to navigate your world to find what you're looking for. Then we just right click around this to select the entire thing, make sure it's all highlighted in purple. Then we'll go to File, Export for Rendering, pick a place where you want to save the file, and then we'll push Save. You can keep everything in this next window the same if you want. I only changed some things as just my personal preference. I changed this block size a little bit lower. And I usually check these split materials into subtypes. That's something you don't have to do, it's only if you want to have separate materials for different colors of the same block, if that makes sense. Next we'll open Blender and we'll delete out that cube, and then we're going to go to File, Import, and we're going to import a wavefront.obj. Then we'll navigate to wherever it is we saved our file. It should have multiple files saved in that same location, but we want the .obj file. Then import that in. Now with this here, I don't tend to move it around unless I want to make it bigger or smaller. I'm going to scale it down just a little bit using S to scale, and that looks pretty good. Now the next thing I'm going to do is add some lights to my build. And we already have this light in place, so I'm going to grab this and just change it and adjust it for what I want. If you want to move the light, an easy way would be to double tap G, and that will allow you to grab the light and move it freely. Over here on the right, I'm going to click this little icon that looks like a point light. And I'm going to change this from a point to an area lamp. Now I can see the direction of the lamp, and if I double tap R with the lamp selected, I can freely rotate it. So we can double tap G to move things. We can also press G once and then middle click and drag it along any axes to move this. I usually do it this way to get it in a more precise location. Now if we want to preview this to see how it's looking with this light, we can click on that little ball in the top right, and this will toggle our render preview. Right now it is using the raw and render engine. EV is enabled by default, which is why it is moving so quickly, because EV is a real-time render engine. But Cycles is more realistic and my render engine of choice, so I'm going to go to my render settings and switch that to Cycles. If you have a really slow computer and want to keep it on Eevee while you're previewing it and switch to cycles right before rendering, that's fine. But it does make a difference in the preview, because you can see here when I switched to cycles, it did make my whole setting look a lot darker. That's why I prefer to keep it on cycles as I work, so whatever I'm looking at is exactly how the final render will be. Back in my light settings, I'm going to make sure I have use nodes selected so I can adjust the strength of my lamp and make this as bright or as dim as I want. I can also change the size of my lamp by pushing S to scale it. The larger an area lamp is, usually the softer the shadows, so if you wanted to get harsher shadows, you would have the size much smaller and much closer to the object, and softer shadows would be larger and farther away. And I'll keep adjusting that until it's in a location that I like, and I'm going to keep adding in lamps until I get this whole area lit. So I'm going to do Shift A and then add in another area lamp. And you can just keep adding in lights or deleting lights as you wish, changing their colors and strengths till you get something that you're satisfied with. Since we are doing a 360 though, I'm making sure I'm checking all sides to make sure I like how it looks from every angle. Alright, now that my lamps are in place, one thing I have to do with this particular build, I do have a glass block that I used, and usually when I have a glass block I like to adjust the material. It's a little too opaque for what I'm wanting, so I'm going to add some custom materials to it. With that glass selected, I'm going to click on my Materials tab, which is a little ball icon, and you'll see it has this principled BSDF shader right now. So to make this block more transparent with a color, I'm going to change this to a mixed shader. 
and then I'll have two more shader options with that. I'll change one of those shaders to a diffuse, and the next one will be transparent. I'm going to adjust the colors of these. I'm going to give them both purple. You can adjust which way this shader will go, whether it's going to be more diffuse or more transparent by adjusting this bar on top. So the more to the left it will go will be the top shader, which is diffuse. The more to the right, it will be transparent. So I'm just going to mess around with this. I think I do want it to be a little more transparent. I'm going to push it more towards the right, and I think this needs to be brighter. That's looking better. So now we can see that glass texture is actually transparent with a color, and I can see the blocks underneath, and it's kind of matching the rest of the blocks, so it's looking pretty good. Again, all of this is optional. I usually just like to do it with my glass because it does help it look a little bit more realistic. So now we have our lights done. I got my material set, but I do want to add one more thing just to make this a little more interesting. I'm going to add a little reflective surface below it just to make it look cooler. So I want to add in a plane. So we'll do Shift A. We're going to add in a mesh plane. And this should add right where my 3D cursor was in the center. I'll push S to scale it up a little bit looks good. Now we need to give this plane a material, so click on the material icon and click on new. Now to edit this shader, I'm actually going to open up the shader editor, and to do this I'm going to open up a separate window. So you see at the bottom we have our timeline window, I could change that to the shader editor, but instead I'm going to open up a new one. So if you hover to a corner and when your mouse turns into these little crosshairs like this, then you can drag up and create a new window. And then I'm going to go to this top left icon and change this to Shader Editor. Inside the Shader Editor, you can navigate normally just like you would in the viewport. So you can zoom up and see we have our shader and then our material output. So I can delete this principle because we don't need that. We're going to add in our own shader materials. What I want for this plane is to have a gradient texture that fades to transparency, so we need to start adding some nodes. We're going to have to add in a texture coordinate, a mapping, a gradient texture, a transparent shader, a diffuse shader, and a mix shader. With all of those laid out, we can start plugging them into each other. Starting from the left, we're going to plug in the object on the texture coordinate into mapping, mapping into the gradient texture, gradient texture to the mix shader, and the other two shaders into the mix shader as well. And then the mix shader will go to our material output. Then you can see we have this linear gradient now on our plane that goes from solid to transparency, which is what I want. Now I'm going to change the gradient texture from linear to spherical so we have it falling off on all sides. Now if I wanted to change the color, I would just change the color there on the diffuse. But I think for this particular one, I do want to keep it just a neutral white or gray. With our current materials, you can see we do have a little bit of a shadow coming from our parrot. But rather than just a shadow, I want my surface to be reflective. So let's add in a couple more nodes. I'll need another mix shader and a glossy shader. I'm going to copy this mix shader I already have here and plug it in between my diffuse and other mix shader by dragging it on top. Then we'll add a glossy shader and plug that into that mix shader we just added. So you should have your glossy and diffuse going to the same mix shader. I'm going to try to move these around a little bit. Now that we have these all in place, we can start adjusting some of these settings. If we want this to be more reflective, we will change the roughness on the glossy down. And the mix shader, just like before, if you want to show more of the glossy, you'll put more to the right. If we want to show more of the diffuse, it will go to the left. Basically, it's just adjusting the balance of those two shaders that are going into it. So looking at this now, you can see how it's reflecting everything, including my lamps. So that's going to be a problem later on if I want to hide those. I might even have to move this plane up a little more because of the camera angle I'm going to use. We won't be able to see the reflection if it's too far away. So let me adjust this and that looks pretty good. So you can mess around with this as long as you want till you get something you're satisfied with. Now the next thing I'm going to do is change the world background color just so it will blend in with this plane that I've made and give my render a background color. So the easiest way is to just click on the globe over here for the world settings and then change that color right there. 
and I want to make this a light gray to kind of blend in with that plane I made. Now, you might be thinking, was it necessary to make it fade to transparency if we're going to make it the same color? Well, yes, for a couple reasons, because you can still see the edges of the plane if it wasn't fading away to transparency. Also, a reflective surface is also fading away, making it just look a lot cleaner. So we won't see any harsh edges. I'm also seeing a problem with the light sources being too close or too visible on my surface, so I'm just going to adjust these to the best of my ability so they're not pointing down. There's probably a better way I could do this, but I'm just going to take the time to make sure I just can't see anything from the angle I want. Once you have your lighting set up, all your materials in place, and everything how you like it, the final step is to get our 360 camera set up. I'm going to exit preview mode for this so my computer will run a little bit smoother as I set this up. So before we do anything, the first thing we need to do is add in a couple of objects that we'll need. Now we want these items to be centered around the build, and assuming your build is already in the center, your 3D cursor should be as well. If it isn't, you can push Shift S and then push Cursor to World Origin. Then we'll do Shift A and add in a curve circle. I can't see my circle right now because the plane's in the way, so I'm going to do G and middle click and move this up. There we go, and then I'm going to scale it out. And I'm going to adjust the size later, but I don't want to move it from where it is. I want to make sure it's still centered. Now do Shift A again and add in an empty element. And this is just going to be what it sounds like. It's just a blank element that we're going to use for the camera to target towards. And just so we don't lose it, I'm going to scale it way up so we can see it better. But the camera isn't going to be able to see it. It's an invisible element. This next step is just kind of a nitpicky one. If you want to get that camera to line up exactly with the circle, then I'm going to have to do this few extra steps. I'm going to select my circle and press tab, and this will go into the object editor mode. And then I'm going to just select one of these points and then do shift S and we're going to put our cursor to selected. So that moved my 3D cursor to that point exactly on the circle. Press tab again to exit this mode and this time click on the camera. With the camera selected, do shift S and then push selection to cursor. And this will move what we had selected, the camera, to that 3D cursor which was on the circle. So now our camera is exactly positioned on our circle. Now the next step is to tell this camera that we want it to go around the circle. We want it to follow the circle. So to do this, we have our camera selected, then we'll shift click on the circle so we're selecting both of them. Then we'll right click and then click on parent and then follow path. So now if we go in our timeline and actually play this, you can see our camera is rotating around that circle. And we can clean up the timeline later, but that is a good start. Next, we need to get the camera to look in the right direction. So we want it to look in the middle where our build is. That's what this empty element is for. Select your camera first, and then on the right, you're gonna look for this button that says Object Constraints, and we're going to add a track to. In the target area, go ahead and put the empty element, telling this camera to target that element. Then we're going to change these settings. We're going to make it go to negative Z, and we'll change the up to Y, and then we'll also check the box that says target Z. So with all those settings in place, your camera should automatically be adjusted to look at that empty element, and when it follows around the path, you can see it's staring at it all the way around. Now if we push zero, we can preview our camera and see the path that's following it. So this is exactly what we want. We still have to make a few adjustments, but now the camera is all set up. So now to adjust the actual position of my camera and what's seen, I can move the element and the circle. So by moving the element, it will actually move with my camera. My camera will continue to follow that element wherever I move it. So I'm going to try to put this as close to the center as possible or whatever angle I want this camera to be looking at this. If I change the scale of the circle, you can see it's also changing how far away the camera is from our build. My camera preview is looking really small and I can't zoom up because I have this setting checked. If you push N, you will open up this properties panel and find the lock camera to view. Make sure that is unchecked and then you can zoom in on your camera view. When it is selected, it means whenever I move in my camera view, 
I'm actually moving the camera and it's also moving my circle with it. So that's not what we want. Normally I would recommend checking it because it is easier to move a camera that way, but it's better to have it unchecked for this kind of render. You can continue to adjust the empty element in the circle till you get your camera positioned in a way you like. You could also go in the camera settings and adjust some things in there such as focal length, it's totally up to you. Depending on how you want your 360 to go, for mine, I like mine to be completely inside the camera, so you might have to check all the angles to make sure your build is in the frame on all sides. But again, that's up to you. Now that I have my camera positioned like I want it, I have to set how many frames I want this 360 to be. So with my circle selected, I'm going to click on the circle options here. And then under path animation, we can set the amount of frames. I usually do mine anywhere between 150 to 200 frames. It really just depends on how fast or slow you want it to go. And let's be honest, how much time you're willing to spend on this render. 15 frames can make a big difference. Now taking those frames, we want to go to output and we want to change the end frame to the same number so that our camera won't render more frames than necessary. Now if I preview this, our timeline will continue to loop and our camera will continue to spin. So that is what we want. Last step is to finish off these output settings and then we're going to be ready to render. I would highly advise that you consider what you're going to use this GIF for in the long run. If you're going to be posting it on social media or if you're going to be using it as a portfolio piece, depending on what you want to use it for will determine what resolution you want to save it as. If you are just going to post this on Twitter, for example, which is what I usually do with mine, you don't need a super large file size and you're only limited to like 15 megabytes anyway. So what I usually do is lower the resolution to about 40 or 50%. Since it's going to be downscaling anyway to go on Twitter, I might as well just render it at a lower resolution and it also saves me a heap of rendering time. So if you don't want the render to take forever and if you don't need a super large file, then I would recommend changing the resolution down a little bit. Next thing to do is select an output location where you'll want these rendered images to save. That's pretty straightforward. You can enter a name there too and it will name them and number them for you as it renders. And then last thing I usually do is just go to sampling and then adjust that and that will just help with the clarity of the image. I'm going to try mine at 200 and then I'm going to do a test render. I'm just going to click on render and render image and this will render just the first frame and I'm just going to look it over. I don't need a super high resolution so I think that looks fine. Once I'm happy with everything, then I'm going to go to render and then render animation and it will render every single frame which for me is 175 frames. So you can imagine that this could take a very long time, so you have to be patient with it, leave it for an hour or two or however long it takes. Again, this is why I always use a lower resolution when rendering. I'm gonna let all these render out and I'll be right back. Once you have all of your images rendered out, then we'll open Photoshop and then we're gonna go to File and Scripts and Load Files into Stack. Then we'll click Browse and we'll find all of those images that we just rendered and load them all in. Once they are all loaded in here in this little window, then we can push OK and they'll start being placed as individual layers in our Photoshop file. This might take a while depending on how many frames you have. Now all we have to do is put our layers into a timeline. So if you don't already have the timeline window open, you'll just go to window and open the timeline window. And down here we'll click create frame animation. Then in the little options box on the right, we'll click that, then click make frames from layers. And of course that will turn every layer in our document into a frame for part of the animation. And you can set the delay amount between each frame. I always keep mine at the default though with no delay. If you had any post processing you want to do, you could do that here. But once you are satisfied with this frame animation, I'm going to convert this to a video timeline by clicking on the options box and clicking the convert to video timeline. And I have found that this makes it just a little bit smoother when exporting it out as a GIF. That looks good. Now I just have to go to file, export, save for web, and then we'll save it as a GIF. 
And once again, you can check your file size in this corner here to make sure it's a file size that works for whatever you're doing. Like I said before, if you're posting this on social media, you'll wanna make sure it's within the limit that is allowed on that social media website. So you can check that there and make adjustments as necessary. That's pretty much it. Then you'll just push save and you'll have your GIF animation all ready to go. At this point, this is pretty much the extent of my Blender knowledge, but there are plenty of other great tutorials out there if you did want to find out how to do something specifically. I just wanted to compile some of what I've learned into one comprehensive video, and I hope this does the trick. And hopefully you learned something. Have a great day and have fun rendering.